Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the Friday panel series of the International Writing Program's Fall Residency. Our thanks, as always, to the staff of the Iowa City Public Library and to Dean Russell Ganim from International Programs who provided the funds for the food in the back. For those of you who are new to our programming, we've given our writers a topic to consider and present to you today. Uh, copies of their presentations will be available next week on our website at iwp.uiowa.edu where you can also find biographies and writing samples from our writers and a schedule of our upcoming events. You can also find this information by scanning the QR code on the bookmarks that are available at the back of the room next to the pizza. <laughs> now for today's panel. Nature on Edge. Nature, the great outdoors, was among the few safe spaces during the pandemic. At the same time, we are inundated by news of the imminent collapse of the natural world. Are plants, animals, storms, heat, dust present in your writing? What description, literary or scientific, of nature has left a special mark on you? Our format for every panel is the same. I'm going to introduce the writers going down the list. They'll each give a brief presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Ida is going to wander around with the microphone. And uh, please wait until, to ask your question until the microphone has arrived, because uh, we want to be sure that folks at home watching on YouTube can hear you. So immediately to my left is Reeta Pekenen. Uh, Reeta is a poet based in Turku, Finland. She is the author of four volumes of poetry, whose titles are translated as Small Hard Buds from 2014, Tendril from 2019, Smugglings from 2021, and Cut Tulips in 2023. Often fragmentary and minimalist, Pekenen's poetry focuses on the themes of personal and environmental loss, non-human perspectives, flora, and natural semiotics. Pekenen is a former chair of the board at Nuoren Voiman Lieto, the association organizing Poetry Moon, which is Finland's largest poetry festival. She is also a member of the publishing cooperative Poesia and a former editor of the poetry magazine Tuli and Savu. Her poetry has received awards, including the Kalevi Janti Prize, uh, Katri Vava Prize, uh, Tulis Tuliskivi Prize, Temporary City Hall Literature Prize, and the uh, Silja Hidenheimo Memorial Stipend. Her participation is courtesy the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. To her left is Aigerim Taji. He is a Kazakh poet and the author of the poetry collections Theologian and Paper Thin Skin, which was published in the US by Zephyr Press after winning a fellowship from the US National Endowment for the Arts. The book was listed as one of the year's most notable translations by World Literature Today and one of the year's top 10 books by Medusa. Her poems have been widely published in Europe, Asia, and the US, translated into many languages, and have received international literary prizes. Her work has been featured in literary magazines and anthologies such as the Kenyan Review, the Massachusetts Review, Prairie Schooner, Atlanta Review, Colorado Review, Salamander, and Stand. Her participation was made possible by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. Next is Swoer, our third presenter. Uh, he was born in 1992 as He Singwi. Uh, he adopted the pen name Swoer in 2008. A member of Guangdong Writers Association with a Master's of Comparative Literature and World Literature degree from Wuhan University, he has published the novel Night of the Felling in 2020 and co-authored Those Sad Monsters and Beasts in 2018. His short stories have appeared in literary magazines such as Harvest, Flower City, Zongshan, Shanghai Literature, Chengjiang Literature and Art, Mountain Flowers, Lotus, and One Way Street, and has been included in Selected Stories and Journal of Selected Novelettes, among others. He was awarded the Youth, Poet the Youth Prize of the third Zhangshan Star Literary Award, the 43rd Hong Kong Youth Literary Award, and the sixth Pulsar Seer Award. He was also shortlisted in the 2020 Harvest Literature List. 
his latest writing focuses on the dispersion of cultures, the connection between historical and realistic images, and the rich inner world of man as an individual within a broader southern framework. He participates thanks to a grant from the US Consulate General in Guangzhou. Yashika Graham is a poet, fiction, and nonfiction writer, visual artist, and radio broadcaster from Jamaica. She won the, two, the 2019 Mervyn Morris Prize for Poetry from the University of the West Indies, Mona, where she read for a bachelor's degree in literatures in English and twice won the Poetry Clash competition. She has been awarded a Centrum Writers Residency and has been featured on stages including the Dodge Poetry Festival, Bristol Festival of Literature, the World Festival of Poetry, and the Port Townsend Writers Conference, where she also delivered craft talks and taught cross-genre workshops. Her poetry, prose, and literary criticism have been published internationally, including in Spillway Magazine, Magma, Cordite Review, Prelit, Bookmarked, Jamaica Journal, the Caribbean Journal of Social Work, and others. Her debut collection, Some of Us Can Go Back Home, is forthcoming from Blouse and Skirt Books. She participates courtesy of a grant from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. Please join me in welcoming our four writers today. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all here. My name is Reta Pekkonen, and I will read my presentation now. One of these mornings, I was walking down the stairs of Iowa House Hotel. On one of the steps, I saw a bug, a rather repelling one, really, a curved brown body of hard chitin, buzzy wings, a countless number of legs, laying helplessly on his back. As I approached, he wiggled one of his long legs slowly in the air, as if in the most delicate request for my attention. As I started to walk past him, he began to flail all his legs around furiously. For a moment, I was going to leave him, but I knew that would have stayed with me on my morning walk, pinching me with annoying little big questions. Why was it that I didn't stop to help him? Was it his size, the number of legs, strangeness of the chitin? Or was it just my own ignorance? So I took the hotel key card from my pocket, carried him out on it and dropped him in the bushes for my own sake, as much as his. A small bug also plays a big role in the famous novel, The Passion, according to G.H. by the Brazilian author, Clarice Lispector. In the novel, G.H. is cleaning her former maid's room when she gets scared of a cockroach creeping out of a wardrobe. In a fit of anger, she slams the wardrobe door on the cockroach. The door cuts the roach's body in half, but fails to kill him. G.H. becomes mesmerized by the repelling encounter, and as hours and pages go by, the cockroach becomes a gateway for her to explore the origins of existence. Quote, Take what I saw, because what I was seeing with an embarrassment so painful and so frightened and so innocent, what I was seeing was life looking back at me. How else could I describe that crude and horrible raw mat and dry plasma that was there as I shrank into myself with dry nausea, I falling centuries and centuries inside a mud it was mud in which the roots of my identity were still shifting with unbearable slowness. Quote ends. Ultimately, G.H. overcomes her utter disgust and horror, and here comes the unforgettable catharsis. She takes the white paste that is slowly oozing out of the cockroach's crushed body and puts it in her mouth. 
I have always greatly enjoyed the phrase, you are what you eat. <laughs> the appeal for me is in the combination of how commonly and lightheartedly it is being used and how profoundly true I find it to be. Lispector writes about the metaphysical intermingling of matter and consciousness, the eater and the eaten, so vividly that it's almost unbearable to read. Her dazzling, dizzying sentences make me experience this strongly. The most accurate description of reality is not a clear picture of a clear thing, but a very blurred image of something that is fundamentally blurred. Mm. Quote, because rising to my surface like pus what my was my truest matter, and with fright and loathing I was feeling that I being was coming from a source far prior to the human source, and with horror much greater than the human, quote ends. So, by licking the box crust body and immersing herself with his innards, does G.H. become the cockroach? No, not exactly. How I read the novel is that G.H. arrives to a profound realization that they, her and the cockroach whom she had violently cut in half, were the very same thing to begin with. The specter is a master of unseeing and unwriting categories, such as those drawing lines between human and any other organism. This is why I think her work is needed today more than ever. We live in an era of ecological grief caused by a great and fatal illusion, an illusion of being a separate, independent unit both as a species and as super-individual human beings. What reading Lispector and good poetry can do at its best is give us tools for recognizing, embracing, and ultimately falling in love with the ambivalence and paradoxicality of the everything that we call nature. It can help us form a deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of our existence, of all the beauty and horror, grief and distress, ours and that of the cockroach. Perhaps then we can start unseeing the gap between the self and the other, the eater and the eaten, just like happens to GH. Perhaps the most relevant question then is not how we are treating others regardless of their species, but to put it more simply, how we are, for our own sake, as much as anyone else's. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Egirim Daji. I'm a poet from Kazakhstan. Today I will read my text, uh, which I titled Following the Breath of the Earth. This past spring, lying on a sand dune in the desert, in the middle of the night, and looking up at giant stars that seems more tangible than nearby a village, I remember thinking about how no one really knows what our world is. What is nature itself? It is everything that exists in the universe, absolutely everything. That being said, the word everything is not so easy to accept. The reason is that you cannot get to know the world by breaking it down into parts, followed by structuring and labeling it. The world is infinite and can only be apprehended with senses. Regardless of that, people tend to separate themselves from nature. At one pole, we have nature living a life of its own. Opposed to it, there is the human being, a bystander, or at worst, an active destroyer. Meanwhile, we are nature too. 
we are a part of it. From this point of view, anything we do becomes a part of nature as well. There you are. Just looking at the road and you see a swarm of ants carrying a piece of sandwich that someone dropped. Next to it, a blade of grass has made its way through uh, the concrete. And the tiny plant is even about to bloom. No matter what you do, nature will have its way. Because the natural world and the technology-filled human world with its microchip-like cities are inseparable. Sometimes we just don't notice how the extremely urbanized world we live in is still permeated by nature, with sand from the desert landing on our windowsills, bugs mistaking flowers on our screens for real ones, the rain pouring on our cars, the wind helping us generate the energy to charge our gadgets, etc. My ancestors were nomads. They believed in Tengri, the god of the sky, and in Umai, the mother of all people and the goddess of the earth. They worshipped the forces of nature while existing in harmony with the surrounding world. They lived in yurts, circular dwellings made from felt, easily portable as their owners followed bre the breath of the earth. From within those yurts, the sky was visible through a shanirak, a lattice circular opening in the ceiling. Today, spiritual retreats all over the world provide their guests with accommodation in yurts, making it easier to merge with nature for those used to smart apartments equipped with Wi-Fi and a virtual assistant. I can feel that the spirit of nomadic people, their urge to travel and move over land, as well as their appreciation of freedom, were all passed on to me. To me, nature means God, freedom, infinity. My family has always been connected to nature. My grand-grandfather planted an oasis of fruit trees amidst the bare, se severely and arid steppe for long distance travels to rest in. My grandmother befriended a huge wild owl who made himself at home in the attic of her rural cottage returning there every morning from his nighttime hunts. She also knew how to talk to the wind. Inspired by her personality and story, I wrote one of my poems. At the edge of the village, a woman in a stupa ground millet. According to another family story, my dad picked up some acorns off the street of Kiev, brought them to his homeland, and planted the first oaks in the land where they had never grown before. Today, many oak trees grow in that area, all of them being descendants of those original ones. My mom, she knows how to negotiate with plants to encourage them to blossom or give fruit. And I made a dedication to this in one of my poems as well. Still, all of this are just a part of what my family has taught me. Last year, at the International Poetry Festival in Rotterdam, as I was standing on a stage after a poetry reading, facing a darkened auditorium filled with the quiet breathing of several hundred listeners, the host of the event asked me, how, just how do you see the world like that? It feels as if it is alive. Everything in your poetry seems to be alive. And talking to you and your readers. As for me, I just don't notice all of those things. I don't see those little creatures that I got to be aware of through your poetry. I was very surprised to hear that. How, just how can someone not see them? To me, the entire world is alive and undivided. I enjoy observing it and interacting with it. If you were to think of the higher matters, good God would mean the world, the universe, everything that exists. In other words, you could say that nature is God, or the higher intelligence, whichever you prefer. I remember one journey to Tibet where I experienced altitude sickness firsthand. 
Our destination was the high altitude mountain Lake Namtso. According to the local belief, that was where the god Tengri has had dived. Our guides, fearing that someone would unknowingly desecrate that their sacred lake, told us the story of a tourist who washed his socks in the lake and died on the spot. Whether this is true or what exactly happened to the man who washed his weary socks in the sacred icy water at an altitude of about 5,000 meters is really unknown. To me, Tengri, the sky, and nature itself are not something that can punish you for washing socks or overeating on cakes. But a huge field of energy we are all just a part of. We are submerged in nature, and yet we are trying to eradicate it within ourselves. Notably, another meaning of the world nature is the truth, the sense of things, the authenticity. We say, it's human nature when we mean something that makes us human. So the further away we get from nature, the further away we get from ourselves. The closer to nature, the closer to ourselves. In any case, even if we shut ourselves off from it by embracing uh, the con concrete world and the plastic jungle, where everything is a substitute, sooner or later we will return to nature, even if it means dissolving into it at the end of our life journey. Mm -hmm. Hello? Wait. Hello? Uh, I'm Soar. Thanking for having me here. And I have to say I'm not good. Uh, I'm good at a couple of things, but not at reading. Uh, uh, but trust me, I'll make it. And uh, the paper you read right now, it's uh, actually its original version is an essay that's much longer than this. And but maybe I just find this topic is some kind of close to my research recently, and which I'm really interested in. So I write a lot of about. Um, but uh, maybe I misdoed. Um, so I finished my draft, and I sent it to Tammy for ask for advice. And thanks, Tammy. And uh, she did give the advice, and she said, "Oh, that's way too long. Just cut it. Uh, it's not <laughs> not your lecture, okay?" Um, I think that's made sense. So I just, I just cut uh, also from the advice from Ida, yeah, and I just cut a uh, four fifth, uh, four or five paragraph off and make it much shorter. And I also found it reasonable that you never want me a guy so bad at reading to read such a long thing in the public. So um, this is a torture, right? It's a torture for me too. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, I also want to say, uh, say thanks to Grace from the work, uh, translation workshop for helping me to translate it from Chinese to English and also for the revising and pol pol polishing it. And now the torture is coming. <laughs> I'm not joking when I'm saying that I've never set food outside of my hometown, which, was, which has as more as Falconer's postage stamp size Yognapat for until I was 17 years old. Faulkner's fictional town of Yognapatafar gets its name from Yakshamnafar, the language of the Chickasaw tribe. Yognapatafar translates as the river flows slowly through the flatland, a description that reminds me of my hometown, where 6.5 million years ago, lava flows and ash transformed the terrain into vast maritime plains where volcanic eruptions, buried hills, and eruption work together with the tropical climates to create a thick, rust red layer of soil. My young mind saw that flatland of my hometown as a red mirror. As for as long as I can remember, my father would take me on a hike or on a ride on the back of his motorbike through the gleaming ponds, patchwork fields, and scalding coastal roads. That's probably when the seed of curiosity that later grew into my interest in nature was planted in my mind. 
perhaps because of the familiarity or native emotion. Before I left my hometown, I naively thought that the rest of the world would be just like it, with its red plants, its unfading banyan and coconut trees and banana groves, its damp sea breeze that always smell of fish, and its endless droughts with an uh, oppressive heat hovering overhead. People's early childhood memories are variable. Whether they will see mountains and canyons in the next few decades, immortal bonds preserved by Arctic ice, or the island dust that flies on marks, what remains in the deepest parts of one's consciousness is the landscape as record by the eyes of a child. It's like a bomb. You don't know where it will be detonated suddenly. My first novel, Nights of the Falling, mainly takes place in a lychee forest. To be honest, I didn't have any particular reason for choosing the message of a lychee. I only remember that when the idea first came to me, I was on the train home when we slowly passed through a large lychee forest. Those branches and dark green leaves mingle with the afternoon sun to reveal a shining warm quality. In that moment, I was shocked by their vitality and the sleepiness from traveling for uh, eight or nine hours was swept away. I thought, I was born here. I've seen lychee trees before, but never have they seemed so beautiful. Why don't I write novel with lychee trees? So when I look back after writing, taking my time, flipping through the pages again and again, completing, revising, and publishing, I suddenly realize what images match, matches Ling Nan better than the light tree grove. It's something that is here and nowhere else. Its reputation cut through the thick, toxic air, or Zhang Qi, that had surrounded Ling, Nan, Ling, Nan Ling as early as the Tang Dynasty. 13,000 years ago, or 1,300 years ago, in the, in the era before refrigeration and express delivery, horses carry light to thousands of miles to the imperial Paris of the central plant dynasties as a treasure for the aristocrats to taste. In the novel, I write, 我紧跟在他后面走, 跟着他不断地在枝干间绕圈, 我仍然觉得举步维艰, 但其实植株间的距离是一致的, 从外边到里边, 不存在越重越密的情况, 我明白, 过了一会儿, 我的头顶, 脖子边, 肩膀上, 嘎吱窝, 腰间, 大腿边和膝盖边, 仿佛都长出了荔枝叶子, 在可见的范围里, 成片的树叶像是镀上一层厚拉, 把绿的色彩变得不那么尖锐, 就算是反射着阳光也不会显得太过刺目, 而是给人以顿重沉静的感觉, 有些枝干肆意地往四周扩散, 像漆黑的八爪鱼的腿, 八根腿里面有的成直线上升, 有的成曲线垂下, 有的成水平角度向左或右拐弯, 相互间紧紧地交缠在一起, 他们这种生命有点太让人嫉妒了. I walked close behind him, following him as he circled around and around between the branches. I still find it hard to work, but the distance between the plants is the same, and come to understand that the trees in forests don't grow closer together the further in you go. After a while, it seemed as if the leaves of the light tree trees were growing more over me. For my from my head, neck, and shoulders, from my armpits, waist, thighs, and knees. From what I can see, it's as if the leaves can are coated in a thick layer of wax, dulling their green color. Even if it were to deflect the sun's rays, it wouldn't be too striking, but rather would give me a bonded, gentle feeling. Some branches stretch in all directions like the legs of a darkly colored octopus, while some stood as straight lines, some hung in curves, while some were level with the ground, their, land, their ends pointing to the left and to the right, tightly intertwined. Their vitality is a little too enviable. In another of my short stories, The Female Heir, I used the typhoon to develop the plots, 
creating an unspoken misunderstanding between the two heroines. Although it may not stand out amongst the thousands of uh, China's Southeast Coast typhoon narratives, a typhoon is difficult to imagine for those who have lived inland for a long time, especially on the more subtle spiritual level. It's like when I went to big cities in the north when I was an adult. I marveled at the, how those trees grew to haze that the trees in my hometown would never reach, torn apart by typhoons that boom in from the Pacific Airways summer and fall. Those typhoons are given strange foreign names, much like the monsters that block about the fall of the gods in North mythology. Every time they've crossed the border, the streets will be littered with the broken limbs of trees. As a child, I didn't understand the feelings of the farmers whose crops has been destroyed, including my own family. I get excited every time the weather observatory forecast a typhoon because it means school would be canceled. Even though I couldn't play outside, at least I was free from the torment of schoolwork for a day or two. As per usual, the typhoon would create a power outage. So we would spend the stormy night chatting, swaying shadows from the clickling candlelight on the wall. For our simple family of three, those were precious states of exception and moments of intimacy. Interestingly, when I shared this experience with a friend from the southwestern Henduan mountain region, she blinked and offered her wrong narrative, one of a life in a lock, in a lag lock town in Klai. When she was at school as a child, sudden earthquakes will interrupt her classes. The chalk on the lectern will clatter around and even fly onto the blackboard. Then the teacher will usher everyone to the playground. She squats or sits just like those around her, her body pressed against the earth as she felt the throbbing of earth hearts from hundreds of kilometers away. This was her or their state of exception. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Yeah. All right. My name is Yashika Graham. I am from Jamaica. And when we're from Jamaica, we say howdy. We say hello. So thank you so much. Uh, we begin this way. When you reach Pisgah, pause. Allow the red dirt to orient you. Pine feel the senses. Carry you to the border of two-sided concrete adventures and don't ask for directions realities. They'll tell you, go straight. It's not far. Go straight. Stand in the square. Wear protection against the box mentality, but not the memory of little feet dancing through red mud, teeth in journeys through cashew and pine from unending fields. Lest you feel like this child again. Look west from the church, the spot used to mark the mile, the walk to post office, winding round roads, the skipping and fruit picking. This is the journey. Mark it. Focus. Peer into the next parish. Find the slender coconut tree beyond the border of brush, away from asphalt. This is Berkshire. Go deeper still. Find Great River. The spring I sprung from. Find Greenwood. Come home. Let the heart and kerosene lamp your laughter. These are directions from the border. My heart to yours. My mother saves pear seeds to catch the breed, the inside of deep sunset pumpkin to fill the yard with secrets of its vines. My mother is a bush woman, and my poems are bush poems, grounded in the land and the people who live and work closest to it. I was born in my grandmother's room in an old wooden house in the bush. 
I was born in the hills of Westmoreland, Jamaica, in a district called Berkshire. And we did not have a great deal growing up, but there was land. And I was always, I have always been close to the earth and known survival in relation to this land. With no piped water in the district, dry times meant that my siblings and I would have to parcel our gallon jugs and descend the hillsides leading to the spring to catch water for the house. If we were lucky, it also meant finding mangoes. And it meant avoiding the dangers that lurked in the wilderness. This is where much of my writing comes from. But as I lived it then, I didn't know that such a life was something I could write about. I learned early on that the countryside was a place you only visited, that living there was not the ideal condition, that the city was where excitement, wealth, and achievement were possible. The country was the place you came from and always left. So I was always daydreaming, convinced there was an ideal elsewhere. I didn't know we lived in the hills until I'd left. Gully girl, people said, living below Westmoreland's roadsides, believing we were in the dark depths. But they didn't know that even below them, we were at the top of another clearing, that we could see the gorge of Great River, see the morning before it reached the road, how it covered Huntley and Ginger Hill in gold. And I credit Lorna Goodison, former poet laureate of Jamaica, and the first Jamaican to participate in the University of Iowa's international writing program 40 years ago for showing me the example that I could write about my world and its people. Goodison writes, where I come from, old women bind living words across their flat chests, inscribe them on their foreheads and in the palms of their hands. If you don't have the eye, to you, they just look like third world women with nothing much. Under their clothes, on white calico belly bands, they have transcribed ancient texts. And when they see cures for you, their Whitlow fingers braille read medicine words from the base of their bellies. Goodison helped me see sacredness in the seemingly ordinary it is why you will hear my mother come up on water, encounter cattle in my poems, and find yourself running as I did, for there are lessons in a life with the land. To buck a bull on your way from spring is to become strategist. It is to approach, Lord God me dead, to ring, swing your water jug, to reel, to run. I began writing about the bush after I had relocated to the city began to feel that I was now away from the only home I had ever known. I began feeling around in the dark, trying to smell the raw of the river again, see the trees, to remember the names, and give myself directions. Remember, when you reach Pisgah, pause. When you reach Pisgah, pause. Allow the red dirt to orient you. The earliest writers in the Caribbean had a pastoral eye and wrote marveling about the land, not unlike the tourist-centered brochures of today that still tell of inviting beaches, of sand, perfect for all but those who live there. I started marveling at the land too, but we are bodies of water, says Seattle civic poet Jordan Imani Keith suggesting a closing of the gap between humanity and the natural world to say that perhaps we are not as separate as we may believe. And so to write humanity must be to write nature after all, that we too are water, that we too are land. And my mother worries for me that in this city, every pound of yam, every pint of peas I eat is paid for. She questions whether it might not suit me better to be home. But even this bushwoman, my mother, must know that there is more to the land than plants and that I would see more when I looked closer, when I remembered. There is a tumultuous history here. There is scarring and there are secrets that the land holds and that it speaks sometimes only slowly. 
So too the body holds things, often out of fear, like some children do, and like I did when I endured abuses. And yet the land reveals, which we see in the melting ice, the rising sea, the heat. The land is speaking what it has witnessed and endured. And so too, my relationship with home has changed. Our romance has shifted to signal that there is much more to the place than its food, than its sweet talk, like the things we do not tell. Not yet. There are, after all, reasons to not go home. The man who blunders in my body lives there, across the fence of low-lying rocks, where the land boils over with black ants. My name is Yashika Graham. I was born in my grandmother's room in an old wooden house in the bush. My mother is a bushwoman. I write bush poems, and the land speaks finally its memory. In heat, in an island afloat in the rising sea, in me. Thank you. Thanks so much. While you are formulating your questions, I want to let you know about some of our upcoming events in the coming week. Uh, you can join us later today at 5 p.m. for the second in our weekly series of Shamba House readings featuring Ina John Scott, who is from Cameroon, and Busi Siwe Malangu, who is from South Africa. This Sunday at 4 p.m., please join us at Prairie Lights for readings by Tammy Lai Ming Ho, who is from Hong Kong, Roald de Young, who is from the Netherlands, and Elise Bickford, who is currently an MFA candidate in literary translation at the University of Iowa. Afterward, that same Sunday, join us for our second Cinematex screening at 7 p.m. in the Adler Journalism Building, Room 105. We'll be showing The Fisherman's Diary, which was written and directed by Ina John Scott. There will be a brief Q&A with him about his film afterward. And finally, please join us next Friday for another of these panels where the theme will be future perfect. That said, questions? Just raise your hand. Um, I just want to ask the question of whether it is important to have the visual uh, in order to write about it. Um, so for example, if there had been dinosaurs around where you grew up, would you remember them and recollect them and write them? Uh, would future uh, writers be able to write about birds? Three billion of birds have been lost in the last 30 years. So the visual, how is it important to you as a writer? I, I think that I have been privileged to have the visual in the ways that I have. Uh, but I do not know that it is absolutely necessary to have that. Um, and I think many people who write about anything, but perhaps those who write about nature also write about its presence and its absence. So the longing for, the absence of, um, the reaching for, is, are also things that come up in the writing, and I suppose that's present in any thing that you write about. It is the absence of it that causes you to see it a lot of the times. Would anyone else like to respond for the next question? I think Yashika put it so well that there's not much to add. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Does anyone have a question that is or is not about cockroaches? Uh, all right, thank you. So I think, I hope I'll make sense. So my question was actually sparked by um, um, uh, Ajayim, or uh, when you are saying, you know, you, you see nature as, as a god, to you nature is god, and then 
you, you see, there is a voice in thinking about this relationship between humans and the, the rest of the natural world. So when you say nature as God, it means something grand, something big, maybe beyond our comprehension. Um, but there is this sense in, in us, in humans, when we talk about nature that uh, we want to, for example, there are campaigns that we should be responsible. We are responsible. So if there is a natural disaster, if, if there is climate change, if there is uh, uh, a pandemic, you know, humans are always asking questions. What did we do wrong? It means we are not preserving nature. We should conserve mother nature. But my question is, well, to what extent can humans be responsible, you know, in whatever nature decides to do? Because uh, issues like, for example, floods, natural disasters, and uh, so talked about um, typhoons, and Rita said nature always has its way. And even if, if we go back to mythology, you see that there are archetypes, even the Great Flood. I don't think the Great Flood was because of climate change. So nature can decide to do whatever it wants to do. It's, it's this ambivalent force that can destroy, that can heal. So when we say humans ought to be responsible, to what extent can we be, are we responsible for what happens to us, what happens to nature? I just wanted to find out if you have any. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, I think that really uh, the nature is God. Uh, the God, uh, God, uh, God is everything. And so we are a part of this world uh, where the God is um, infinite. And uh, uh, as you asked, uh, I think that uh, we, our world ha has uh, different parts of it. Some of them uh, are lo looks uh, happy uh, and another unhappy, for example. But it is... Uh, at the same time, one world and other parts of uh, one thing. And, uh, for example, typhoons and uh, other bad <laughs> weather uh, things, uh, they are also the part of nature. And we sh I think that we should um, trust to this. It's like a death and birth. It's uh, begin beginning and uh, the end of the same path. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to add to that as well. Uh, to say that it, it seems to me that as humans, we are at once subjects of the living experience, meaning we are just an element of, of nature. And we are undoubtedly active agents participating. Um, I mean, we're sitting in a library. We are, I'm miles and miles away from my home. How did I get here? You know? So we are, we are actively doing things, creating, inventing, and um, building, and contributing to our experience here. What I do want to say is that though some natural occurrences perhaps will happen regardless of us, um, and perhaps in spite of us, there are things that happen as a result of us, and that my position is that we should try to do as little harm as we can and to do corrective work around the things that we have done, right? So yes, the earth is grander than we are, but there are things that we have done that affect us continuously and that will continue to affect us and that we do need to act to either correct or to ease the burdens of those things as much as is possible and to do no harm further. Uh, uh, Yashika's answer is excellent. I want to ask something on behalf of her. And uh, I think that we human beings didn't put us to a correct position because I think that all anxiety or all the thoughts we made that can be due to uh, what we thought. Um, and we think, because we are human beings, that we, th we have minds, we have thoughts, that we naturally or we take for granted for thinking us as the center of the universe. But actually, it is not. Um, actually, if you remove this... Uh, sense of uh, non-mankind centrism, then you think that every, everything could be a center, right? And just like uh, 
just like, uh, for example, just like the microphone on the desk. Maybe in the microphone's world, is it is the human being. I'm the microphone, and it's like a, a strings. Uh, I'm a monster with strings, uh, ugly body and shape. So that's the point. And I thought as it should change the position to think about nature. Oh, that's my answer. Got a few raised hands. Thank you very much. I know that dealing with anything or anyone based on guilt is uh, going to produce an unhealthy relationship. And uh, talking to nature, at least mentally, that we are always guilty is something that I try personally to uh, avoid. One more thing that I try to avoid is looking at nature from the tourist company's pamphlets. Nature means a nice mountain and greenery. Nature could mean something else. Uh, it, it could mean the flow of blood within my own body, the cockroaches, the typhoons, and the stars, and the bushes. But nature could also be what we men, humankind I mean, have made to the planet nicely. Like the architecture of big cities that are very present in novels and poets. And my question now is, can you think of any of your works that you could present to us or any of the great works that could have happened without human-made nature? Basements, big towers where people have su made, committed suicide and so on. I don't know that we have to pitch human, human nature against trees necessarily to prove one or the other. I have, I have wondered about that very often in terms of if, I mean, this is plastic, right? But where did it come from? Like everything came from here. So that's also something, I'm not answering your question, but, <laughs> but that's also something I've wondered. Like, is this natural, you know, because it does come from natural, the natural, right? So that's also something that is up there. In, but I don't know that we need to say, all right, we have done things and that is part of nature. And so we are, the trees are, the buildings are, that we have to prove that we are nature. I was not trying to ask for proof. I was just saying, could have literature happened mm -hmm. without the man-made nature, apart from the nature? Liter you're talking about written literature, or? Hmm. I don't know. I think the creative work, storytelling, was there before the written, you know? And so perhaps that's always been with us, with humanity and with birds and the trees. Uh, it, someone said that the, the first poem was a sound, you know? And so... There is, there, is, there is literature and storytelling in those spaces as well. Um, but certainly, we have been able to add to based on our own creations as well. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel it always like in nature panel discussions, it, like everything seems to become impossible in five seconds after starting the discussion, because <laughs> like, like what we heard in our presentations, it's such a big word and such a big turn, it, it's about everything, so in order to discuss nature, we have to basically talk about morality, philosophy, like natural sciences, it kind of includes everything, so yeah, I definitely have no answers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be our last question. Does anybody else on the panel want to comment? One last question. One last question. Okay. Thank you guys for the brilliant presentations. Ali, uh, I think you tried to pick something from my question. <laughs> I will forgive you for that. <laughs> 
I think uh, <laughs> this is it. Uh, like this is what I jotted. Why you guys were having that marvelous presentation? Don't kill a cow; you will have no protein. Don't hurt a tree; will have no books, and writers will be wiped off the face of the earth. To what extent do we have to preserve nature? Is there a balance we could aim at? If yes, what percentage? You're a troublemaker. In a, in a <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful question. Yeah, I guess I I would just like to emphasize like how important I find like the ambivalence of this all. Like it it's impossible to draw lines between you should be doing this and shouldn't be doing that. But for me, it's more about like allowing yourself to feel those opposite feelings and to realize the opposite facts and to embrace those, not, not aiming to have a clear solution for these ans uh, questions. I, I think I agree with you because much of our existence in the world, we are imposing on the other elements of nature, right? So as you say, um, we wouldn't have books if we didn't do away with some trees. And so a lot of the things that we enjoy, we are, we are creating impositions on the other elements of the world. So it is a, a valid um, question. I agree with you, Retta, that the it is perhaps for us to see where we can do good rather than to say it is absolutely impossible or to say that we are always living in opposition to the other elements in nature. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists for these presentations. Thank you to the audience. I hope we'll see you again next week. <laughs>